subject is Boost Control Setup Part 1, Open Loop. Topics for today, we'll actually review some of the previous webinar that I have conducted on Boost Control. And I would strongly suggest that people watching this webinar have previously watched the Helpful Hints on Boost Control Plumbing webinar. If the boost control plumbing is not correct uh, and sorted, no point in trying to get the computer to do electronic boost control of the engine. You'll struggle all day long and get nowhere. So that really is a must to previously watch the helpful hints on boost control plumbing. So uh, we'll go through some of the plumbing diagrams from that webinar. We'll talk about some precautions again before we get into putting this engine under any load. And uh, briefly talk about the two methods that uh, we have available for controlling boost. Two main methods. I had a little bit of feedback from the last webinar that some people didn't understand the term duty cycle so we'll cover that to a small degree as well today. And then I'm going to go through each of the menu items in the boost control setup, just so you understand what each uh, setup item means. And that way it'll help you understand, um, depending on the method that we use, what, what to fill in where. We'll do some uh, talking about the testing of uh, your setup and some AIM table examples. Uh, the AIM table, of course, is the boost control AIM of what you would like the boost to be. And then there's some logging results I've got at the end. OK, so just briefly, uh, again, from the previous webinar, just did some pictures of some basic layouts, uh, common layouts of boost control. This was uh, the older style boost control where effectively there was no external intervention, no one adding or subtracting anything to the boost line and boost is controlled by the spring pressure in the wastegate actuator. Um, then in the early days people put on some manual taps into the boost line effectively wasting air away from this actuator and oh, people rolling in just bear with me hi folks uh, just just started so re reviewing some of the previous webinars screens so back to uh, the manual control system so effectively we have a, a spring controlled manual actuator that can be overridden by bleeding air away so the air pressure doesn't get to the top side of the diaphragm therefore doesn't press the spring down therefore doesn't open the exhaust wastegate boost goes up open the tap more more air is wasted away out to atmosphere therefore the boost less it needs more boost in the compressor to achieve enough pressure to open the wastegate actuator not a bad system and particularly if you just want to lift the boost to a, a set value, uh, it works fine. Difficult on the fly though if you want different boosts at different times. So then uh, the first vehicles arrived with um, duty cycle based solenoids. And effectively we have a solenoid in line on the bleed and the solenoid pulses on and off to bleed air out. The computer controls the width of the pulse or the duty cycle and the amount of on time versus off time is the duty cycle. So if the valve is on for 50% of the time, on for half the time and off for half the time, that's called a 50% duty cycle and we'd expect to bleed half the amount of air away that the, sol the solenoid is capable of bleeding. So if it can flow 10 cubic feet per minute at 50% duty cycle, we would hope that it would flow something like 5 cubic feet per minute away from the pressure line going to the wastegate. And then we got two three-way valve, uh, valves controlling boost. Um, 
and this was, um, I'm not sure the reason they're invented, but people started using them. If I just go back actually to explain some of the downfalls. When you have a, uh, a valve system like this bleeding air away from the boost line here, the restrict you require a restrictor if you want to bleed a lot of air away or if you want the boost to go up a long way. The reason for that is if the solenoid can only flow, and our example was 10 cubic feet per minute away at 100% duty, in other words, the, the valve is open the whole time, and there is uh, a capability of 15 cubic feet of air through the lines, it might mean that you can't get rid of enough air out of the valve to the atmosphere to lift the boost high enough. So the way to um, help that work better, and in fact manufacturers, factory install a small restrictor in the line. So for instance, Mitsubishi and, and Subaru both, the Evo series and uh, WRX XDI series for the Subarus, have in line just before the T junction a small restrictor. So in our helpful hints on boost control webinar, we talk about reducing the size of that restrictor to help lift the boost higher uh, if the duty on the valve is too high. So if you have, you can have the, the whole system plumbed up perfectly and you might get to the point where the boost goes up as you increase the duty cycle, but it may only get to a point where the where you're say three or four pounds short of your aim boost value. So for example, maybe you're after 18 pound and at a at 50% duty cycle you get to 13 pound and at 80% duty cycle you get to 16 pound and you go all the way to 100% duty cycle and you only get one more pound boost. So the problem is that the the valve is not letting enough air away from the system and so decreasing the size of the restrictor allows more air to be bled away from this part of the um, of the, the, the hose hoses etc not sure the word for that obviously anyway um, tuning the the plumbing uh, goes a long way towards helping the computer get the boost control linear and uh, within the range you want. So it's quite important. It's very much a two-stage uh, deal, setting up a good, successful boost control system. Okay, so, but one of the ways of getting away from the restrictor uh, thing is to use a three-way valve. Now this valve, if we're still plumbing on a uh, an integral waste scrape, Gate. So that's a wastegate that you would see on a factory car where the wastegate is part of the, the turbo. When the valve is off in this case, the line between the compressor and the actuator is open and therefore the spring gets compressed and the boost goes down. And, but when the valve is on, the line between the compressor and the actuator is closed. As you can see, there's no path here, and it simply opens and bleeds out the air from the high side of the actuator. So what this does, without the need of a restrictor, allows uh, the duty cycle range of the solenoid to basically increase the boost to any, any amount that the system is capable of. Um, so it's quite an effective way of doing it. The valves, I assume the reason manufacturers don't use these valves is they're expensive because I, I'm sure there are maybe manufacturers that do use them, but I haven't seen any. The majority of manufacturers, Japanese, etc., that um, I've seen in use, even up to last year's Evolution 10, all using uh, a system like this, a single solenoid or a single path solenoid. So uh, aftermarket wise you can buy these valves, Motec sell them and there's a number of other valves that are similar that do a similar thing. So if you plumb them up in this manner for this type of boost control system they work very well. 
Um, things get more complex when you start to use a remote wastegate. So the majority of people running larger boost and aftermarket turbos uh, usually find they have uh, remote wastegates. And the, we recommend the plumbing for those remote wastegates goes in this fashion here, whereby you have a line underneath with no valve in it going from the compressor to the underside of the diaphragm. This line helps to lift the wastegate very quickly when the air is bled away from the high side here to reduce the boost. So in this particular case, when the valve is on, the boost is released or the pressure is released from this side of the diaphragm. Note the spring is on the other side of the diaphragm in this case. So in this case, for a remote wastegate with a three-way valve plumbed in this fashion, when the valve is on, the boost goes down, which is the opposite of the previous screen. Okay, but we do talk more detail in uh, more detail about that in the Hints on Boost Control Plumbing webinar. Anyway, so I'm assuming that you have your system plumbed up and that if we affect a change on the boost control solenoid, that we should see a change in boost level, assuming the plumbing is correct. Now, uh, as with the previous webinar, I want to make it very clear that when you're doing this kind of work, the situation for an overboost to occur is, is, is quite common. Uh, you get some of these settings wrong and you could make an enormous amount of boost inadvertently and uh, potentially damage the engine. So some of the key things that can happen in an overboost situation is that you exceed the pressure of your manifold pressure sensor. So in the example here, um, many people use what's called a three bar map sensor, which measures two bar boost and one bar of vacuum. The two bar of boost, is, which is approximately 28 pound, um, but the total absolute pressure measured by the sensor is 300 kPa. Now in your manifold pressure setup in the input pins, you have an option to use a default value if that sensor goes into error. Now, a sensor will go into error more often than not when you over boost the, or go beyond that sensor's uh, boost rating. So for instance, if it's 300 kPa sensor, then if you go above 300 kPa, you will hit a diagnostic. The voltage will probably go above 4.9 and the sensor will go into error. Now, the default number in most of the setups around uh, the basic MoTeX start file, of course, we don't know what people are using that for. The default number in here is 100 kPa. So if this thing happens to make 320 kPa of boost and uh, you've got a rather um, excited man on the pedal, and he's holding it flat there at that, at that uh, boost level, the sensor will go into error. And if you don't change this default value, when the sensor is in error, it will use the existing number, which often can be 100 kPa. So the computer then looks up the fueling for 100 kPa, and the engine, if it was tuned reasonably well, would lean out and potentially hurt itself. So we need to prevent that by, uh, if we can. So we can put in here a default value. Now you could even make this 330 kPa if you wanted. So if ever the sensor went into error on a high diagnostic voltage error, we, the computer will use a substitute value. And if it used 330 kPa, then that should be a nice safe amount of fuel Obviously, we can put up some warnings and, and a few other things, but that's the first thing that I want you to check. Okay, uh, the second thing, uh, in the boost control setup, so under functions boost control, in the first setup page, there is a thing called over boost cut. Now, this is a very severe cut, and, and it, in fact, it's a 100% fuel cut. And what happens is that if the manifold pressure exceeds the value that you put here, all injectors sh are shut off until the manifold pressure falls below. So 
it, it is a severe cut, but it is an, uh, an all-out protection and to allow you to um, have some indication if you are driving the car, riding the ski, driving a boat, of knowing that the, the, the engine is uh, over-boosting by a dramatic amount. Now, I would run this, say, 20 to 30 kPa, kPa above your aim boost. So if we had an aim boost where you wanted to run 220 kPa most of the time, then an overboost cut of 250 might be appropriate. Because the last thing we need in the race is for this to the boost having a little surge, a little over spike, and we don't need it, it touching this overboost cut. So just use it wisely. But on those first few runs when you're testing your system, when any sort of boost could occur, it's a, it's a good way of just making a, a safety. Some big turbos can make astronomical amounts of boost and blow hoses off and cause you all sorts of grief. You're trying to get the tuning done, so this is a way of just protecting it. All right, now there are two main methods used by the ECU to control the level of boost. Um, the first method we call open loop. So this is where we set in the aim boost table a particular duty cycle and that's what's used by the computer. So for instance at 6000 RPM we might end up with a number of 70 in our aim boost table and what that means is 70% duty. So the solenoid is on for 70% of the time and off for 30% of the time and this will mean a set amount of air is bled through the solenoid and the boost will get to a, as measured by you, a set number. It's not closed loop. It's not an amount of boost that you're asking for, not, not like 10 PSI or 16 PSI. It's simply a duty, a duty uh, of, of the solenoid. So that that's therefore open loop. It doesn't um, try and achieve a certain boost. It's simply, the computer simply looks up the aim boost table and runs that number, whatever it is. Now, this is uh, when you're setting up a boost control system, regardless of what you end up with, even if you go to a closed loop system, you have to start by using an open loop system and recording all the normal duty cycles that are required to run boost levels. Different boost levels will require different amounts of duty cycle uh, on the solenoid to achieve them. So no matter which method you are using, you need to start by using the open loop method. The nice thing with the open loop method is that there's, there's no unpredictability and doesn't rely on someone's skill on doing PID control and it does exactly the same thing every time. Now if the boost is varying, it isn't the computer doing it. It'll be something to do with the system. So it allows you to dial in your mechanical, uh, the mechanical side of your boost control system. Get that right, get that as, as good as it can be, and then you move to a closed loop system using PID algorithms. So, but today's webinar is about open loop only, and a future webinar will be on closed loop. That future webinar on closed loop will be following a separate webinar on PID control. So we'll need to learn what the terms P, I and D mean and um, have some idea of how they affect a control system. All right, just a, um, not, not the flashiest of drawings, but a small, small drawing on duty cycle and um, Sometimes it helps to have a drawing and sometimes it doesn't, maybe. But anyway, for the, this is a, a scope trace or a voltage trace of a solenoid in operation, a boost control solenoid. So if we were to put an oscilloscope or a good multimeter on the wire of the solenoid, we would see when the solenoid was off, we would see 12 volts. And when the ECU turns the solenoid on, it grounds it. So that then energizes the coils in the solenoid and opens it. Now if we turn it off again before the, the coils get fully energized, then 
the, sh the shuttle valve inside doesn't quite open the whole way. And by varying the amount of on time versus off time, we can move the shuttle valve like a needle valve inside the solenoid at, in, at different heights off the seat, so at different distances. So by turning it on for a longer period of time, we would normally allow the solenoid to flow more air. And on some systems, flowing more air means boost up. And on other systems, flowing more air means boost down. So it can be quite confusing. You need to understand what your system does and what the, so the duty cycle is doing um, by looking at your log data and looking at the setup. So if the solenoid is... Uh, the computer is grounding the solenoid and the current is flowing, uh, that's deemed to be turning it on. And so if it's on for a quarter of the time, and so on for 25% or a quarter of the time and off for three quarters of the time, we call that 25% duty cycle. So the cycle time is the time from the first, between each, each time it goes to open. So at this point where the arrow is, it's opening the, the first time and over here is the next time it opens so that becomes the cycle time and then simply that if you were to measure the on versus off time that would give you a percentage of a hundred out of a hundred and that would be the duty cycle now it's useful to understand that most solenoids will do very little at 10 percent either end so from zero to ten percent you'll get virtually no airflow and from say 90 to 100 percent you'll get virtually no more airflow and that very, is very much affected by the type of solenoid now I've, I've got one at the moment actually on a jet ski at say um, I think they call it a Mac valve it's a blue one used by other uh, some other ECU manufacturers and it's an extremely coarse solenoid it's got a lot of airflow and at the moment, from my lowest boost setting to my highest boost setting, I only have a number change of 10. So 18, a duty cycle of 18 is the lowest boost I can get. And a duty cycle of 28 is the highest boost I'm prepared to run at this point. And I'd suggest probably by 35 or 36 duty, it'll be out of any more boost. It'll be well over sort of four bar. So... So we need to find out what duty cycle range affects the boost in the area we want to run. Um, so for different valves and different plumbing, the numbers will be different. So just uh, to understand and to review some of the basic setups and the basic difference between open loop and closed loop, as with all the uh, all of the score, most of the screens in the Motec software, if you press F1 in any table, you will get an explanation of uh, what's relevant. So if you go to functions, boost control, and then to aim boost, and get into that table, which you see down here, and press F1, you get a description of the differences between open loop or simple duty cycle control and closed loop. And in that uh, same help screen, it will give you the numbers to put in all the tables that are not used during uh, simple duty cycle control. It's quite critical to get those numbers correct, otherwise your, uh, even the simple duty cycle control will not work. You can always review this webinar. All right. Uh, and the other basic setup that you need to do when you're setting up your boost control is, um, apart from obviously wire the solenoid to the correct output, is to allocate the boost control function to the appropriate auxiliary output that you have wired the solenoid to. So most solenoids will be wired to 12 volts and the power goes through the solenoid and then to the ECU. And then the ECU takes the... Uh, the power or the ground or the current, the current, sorry, to ground uh, by pulsing the solenoid. So all we need to do is select the boost control function, which was uh, obviously our first function we ever did because it's number one, and then go to the parameters, and you can see them down here, 
and then set their parameters as appropriate. Now you'll need to go back to the helpful hints on boost control plumbing for an explanation on the correct parameters. All right, so uh, again, just a quick review. Normal setup is bigger. What we want in our, in our aim table, I'll just quickly go back so you can see that. This is all about changing the aim table, our aim boost table. And the shortcut for that, by the way, is F7 on the, uh, on the keyboard. So F7 should take you to the aim boost table. And in this table, we want to put a number that represents boost. Again, reviewing in an open loop, that number will be the duty cycle applied to the solenoid. When we're in closed loop, that number will be the actual manifold pressure in KPA, absolute. But we're doing a simple open loop today. So that this is what we're looking for. And if we get our polarities and everything set up right, basically bigger number here should mean more boost. If you find that you've got a bigger number making less boost, then you've got the polarity wrong in the setup. So as I said earlier, different setups can mean, different physical setups can mean duty up equals boost up or duty up can equal boost down. And the polarity fixes that. And you can see again also how that changes. 30% on one system is 30% on and 30% and on another setting means 30% off. If you're not confused now, just wait. It's all right. Anyway, uh, so testing. Uh, we need to add or subtract duty by adding and subtracting numbers in this table. We need to take here and uh, if the boost is low, we, we should lock the gate and find out why. But we'll get to that shortly. It's still a review from our last webinar. Been there. All right, so menu items. So I'm going to go through each item now and give a quick explanation of what what, hap what happens in each screen. So the setup we, we, we covered earlier, the basic setup, which was uh, the type of control and the uh, overboost cut. The main table that you'll spend your time in is the aim boost table. All right, so this is the table where you put in the number that changes what the computer does. So in open loop mode, this number is the duty cycle of the solenoid. So in the example you see here, 100 means basically that valve is on the whole time. So it should be flowing the maximum amount of air possible through the valve. In closed loop, we would be putting in here uh, our aim boost, our actual aim boost that we want to run. And the, and the computer, using PID, tries to maintain that. Now, um, yeah, if it's not tuned right, it won't. So open, open loop, whatever numbers here is what goes on the solenoid. Right, the next number down is the normal position table. So in open loop mode, that's not used, all right? And, the, and when you read the help in the aim boost table, pressing F1, it will tell you to make sure this table is zero. I've just given you a little example of what you might expect to see if it was closed loop. Effectively, the normal position is the, position, the, the solenoid duty that we would expect to maintain a certain boost level uh, at a cert under certain conditions. So for instance, at three and a half thousand, at 200 kPa, if we line up the number, if we've done all our R&D properly, we, we expect the solenoid duty to be approximately 55%. So when we're in closed loop mode, we fill this table out. And I'll speak a little bit more about that later. Right, the next one, the trim. This is a very simple trim, exactly like the overall fuel trim and the overall ignition trim. So this is simply a plus minus percent of the aim table. And again, if you press F1, it will tell you effectively that. So it's simply a percentage of the aim boost table. Whatever numbers in the aim boost table, this will add or subtract that, this percent of that number. Next one is air temp and compensation. 
Now, perhaps you don't need to worry about this under initial tuning, but once you get this setup done, it's quite useful to remove boost if there's any problem with the air temperature. So if you look in the table at this example, you will see that at 60 degrees Celsius, we're removing 20% boost. And if the air temp gets to be 80 degrees Celsius, we're removing 100% of the boost. That still means it'll run whatever the spring on the wastegate is, but at least we've got it down to um, some sort of manageable boost level. The fact is that an air temperature, as determined by the tuner at 80 degrees, is rather hot. If 80 degrees is normal, well, you have zeros there. But uh, in a, on a good race engine, I'd expect to uh, be trying to keep our air temps under 50 degrees Celsius. Just a small note here that uh, all tables in Motec software, or virtually all tables, interpolate. So what that means is anywhere where there is not an actual number here and a corresponding number underneath, the ECU interpolates the two. So if we go exactly between 40 and 60, we get a number of 50. So if the air temperature is 50 degrees Celsius, what would you expect the boost compensation to be? Minus 10. It's an exact linear interpolation. So at 45 degrees Celsius, it would be minus 5. So don't assume because you see a 0 at 40 degrees air temp and a minus 20 at 60, that at 59 degrees air temp, you'll have no boost reduction. Well, you will. So the moment it goes past 40 on its way to 60, the boost will start dropping. Okay, engine temp, same thing. This uh, example here shows um, that the tuner is wanting to be kind to the engine, so he won't let the boost go above, um, above the gate value or the spring value in the wastegate until the engine temperature is at least above 45 degrees Celsius, and you don't get full boost until it's above 50. Just be aware that if this is a boat, and if it's got an open water system, maybe through uh, just a little bit much water going through the engine, the thing might only run 45 degrees Celsius. If someone's opened the tap too much and you're looking for why you've got no boost, you'll need to come here and have a look and, and make some changes. All right, and similarly, up the top, when the engine's starting to get hot, we can remove boost as well. Okay, we've got also a couple of generic compensations. So what that, we give you a, the first one is a 3D table and the second one is a 2D table. So it's effectively three separate sensors that you can use to influence the boost. Now I've got a full throttle timer configured on my first compensation table. Again, it's a very simple plus minus percentage. So whatever the number is in here, it's just a percentage of the aim boost. And I use full throttle timers for testing uh, initially when testing jet skis because you can't be, it's difficult at least, to take your laptop in the jet ski at 70 something miles an hour and start playing with duty cycle numbers to see if the boost goes up or down. So a way of checking the response of the boost control system, especially when running closed loop, is to start a timer at full throttle. So I can run along at 95% throttle and the engine settled at full boost or, or near enough to it. And if I squeeze the throttle all the way to 100, the timer goes off. And then after, in this case, one and a half seconds, I pull 10% out. And then after two and a half seconds, add 20%. And this happens automatically. Now I can download the logging and have a look and see for how the boost control is responding to those requests. So I don't have to worry about doing it on the laptop. The computer just does it. Uh, similarly, if you, you might find that you use a full throttle timer to reduce boost after, say, 10 seconds or 20 seconds of full throttle. So if you need to get off the line um, and beat, beat your competition to uh, the first marker or what, for whatever reason, um, most engines will be able to stand a little bit more boost for the first a uh, short amount of time until the temperatures get high. So this allows you to add that boost and then subtract it away for the rest of the race. 
Uh, and then the next compensation, and again, it's a, just a generic compensation. We can put any table on here. Uh, in this example, I have a channel called uh, Boost Control Comp 2. And this is uh, configured to a nine position switch uh, on the tune up that I've got here. And it was an off road vehicle where the customer has nine levels of boost, and he can simply dial the boost in that he wants for the particular situation he's in. And this particular customer uh, does what's called prologues, where he has a very short race to get the seating for the main race. So he dials it up maybe to position seven or eight or wherever he wants uh, the extra boost to be. And then for the main race, he might leave uh, the first part of the race on position five, 40% more boost in this example. And if he's doing well, he can just dial it back and just dial the boost back and not have to worry uh, about or conserving the engine and not have, not have to worry about taking his foot off the accelerator to conserve the engine. He can just dial back the boost, runs less boost. He can still just hold it flat and um, doesn't have to worry about it. It's a way of quickly adjusting what the computer does without having the laptop or anything like that. Okay, the next three terms are the terms that we use for closed loop control. I will very, very briefly go over them so you can start to get used to what they are. They're uh, not easy to understand and as I say, we'll do a dedicated webinar on them. Now you only use these terms when doing uh, closed loop control. Um, the only time you uh, have a number other than zero in here is for the proportional gain. And as I say, at, at, in each of these screens, I'll tell you what numbers to put in for the open loop setup. So with open loop setup, we have a number of one in here. And that's, there's no tuning, that's what it is. In closed loop, we start with around 0.3, but uh, this number could end up being anything. This is effectively the uh, main effort, or it's a gain factor that the computer uses to try and reach the aim boost when in closed loop. So if your aim boost is 200 kPa and the engine is currently 150 kPa, the computer needs to add more duty to the solenoid. And this number multiplies the amount of duty required by the error. So if the error is 30%, it's 30 away, we multiply 30 times 0.3, which is approximately 10. So the computer automatically adds 10% duty to the solenoid to try and get the boost right. Basically, the larger the number here, the quicker or the more, the greater the step the solenoid takes to try and fix the error. Closed loop control is all about fixing errors. So the problem with too big a number is that it tend, the, the tendency is that the solenoid will overshoot. So if the actual amount of duty required to achieve 200 kPa is 50, and the current duty might be 20, and you put too big a P number in there, the solenoid might go to 90. And so what happens is too much air flows, the boost goes too high, and then the, the duty on the solenoid has to go the other way and you get a hunting effect. Up, down, up, down, and the boost is out of control. So the proportional gain is kind of the main uh, multiplier of the duty cycle to get the boost as close as possible, immediately as possible. I'm not explaining that very well, but anyway. The integral gain is, again, it's a multiplication factor, but it is to do with uh, time. The longer there is an error, uh, the more this, this number keeps adding or subtracting or multiplying to the, to the algorithm to add and subtract duty cycle to get the boost correct. Now, in open loop, we set this to zero, and that's the end of it. In closed loop, we've got to play with this number to get the fine... Uh, the fine tuning of getting the boost just exactly where you want it. But basically, it's a number that's used in conjunction with the amount of time the error exists. The derivative gain, uh, again, is a multiplier. For open loop control, you set it to zero. 
or closed loop, uh, you start with this uh, 0.05. This is kind of like the brakes, the brakes on a car. And Mark's going to probably do the PID uh, control webinar, and he'll talk about a go to woe car and the similarity of what that's like a go to woe race car, and how that's similar to PID. And effectively, this this puts the brakes on uh, a large duty control. If it sees the error diminishing very quickly and sees that uh, we need to slow the duty down to prevent an overboost situation occurring, this affects how much the brakes work. It's a very basic explanation. All right, away from that. Now, back to some basics. This is the uh, minimum duty cycle. In this table here, we can simply clamp the minimum amount of duty that the solenoid will use. No matter what the PID calculates, the, um, we can clamp the minimum to a set figure. And that's then what this does is it stops a lot of boost oscillation. So if, if at a particular, let's say 200 kPa in the example here, and 5,000 RPM, if we log uh, an engine for two or three races and we find that under no circumstance did it ever need any less than 35 kPa to make 200 kPa of boost, sorry, 35% duty, to make 200 kPa, that's not a boost, that's uh, actual, actual um, absolute pressure, so that's 14 pound boost, um, then we have the minimum duty cycle can be set there. So we would always want it a little bit lower if we needed the boost to be lower. So by working out over time what the actual normal numbers are, we can put a clamp on the smallest number the computer gets to use and a clamp on the maximum number. Now, of course, for open loop control, just put zero. All right, maximum duty, the opposite of just of what I said. Obviously, we can put clamps on the maximum amount of duty used. And this is the, definitely the one you concentrate on because overboost is, is uh, the one we want to try and minimize for the health of the engine and sometimes uh, for rules. We don't want boost going over a certain amount. So again, if we log and, and an example at 5,000 revs at 250 kPa, we've logged that we have never, ever needed to use any more than 65% duty to get that boost at that RPM, well, we can safely clamp that at 68. So even if the, when we're in closed loop control, even if this, the algorithm calculates that it wants, say, 80, the computer will stop it at 68 and prevent that overboost occurring. Uh, this, these two figures here are to do with the integral figure. Because the integral figure uh, is is to do with the time, it's to do with time and, and the time that the error occurs. You can integral the integral calculation can wind up. And it's called integral wind up. So that integral wind up can cause the duty to get larger and larger and larger and larger. Uh, and if there's an error that the computer can't fix, the integral number or multiplier keeps adding up. So these two figures, the positive and negative clamps, allow us to stop the duty cycle request winding up too far. Again, we'll, in the next webinar or the PID webinar, we'll go in, into these in more detail. All right, so that, uh, believe it or not, is a basic overview of the setup for your boost control. Uh, now, prior to testing, now that you've got some table numbers filled out, we want to go through some checks. Um, you really shouldn't be attempt attempting to do proper boost control without having the data logging upgrade. You shouldn't be attempting to do anything without the data logging. So we always want to look at our logging. And we need to make sure that after we've done our first test and, and opened I2 to look at the data, that uh, we've actually logged the duty cycle of the boost control solenoid. So make sure you go and log that. In the example I think we used today, it was either auxiliary three or four. So we need to make sure we've got those that channel logged. The other thing I want you to do is make sure that you've got safe ignition numbers at those higher boost values. So if you see this ignition table here, 
normally I allow two to three degrees for every 20 kPa the boost goes up. So if we happen to have the, it might have 14 pound springs in our wastegate and we've tuned all the way to 14 pound and we, in this example, maybe we've got 20 degrees of ignition at seven and a half thousand revs. So we would want at least two to two and a half degrees of ignition out for every 20 kPa that the boost goes up. And if you're sort of learning at this, you'd almost make that three degrees. And this is engine dependent, fuel dependent, and a lot of, lot of things. But as a rule, that's kind of the ballpark of the amount of ignition that comes out per the amount of boost that goes in. Okay, by all means, be more conservative of that than that if you like, but definitely make sure that when if you're doing boost control, that in the areas where the boost could lift way up because the control is not right, we don't need lots of timing in there, otherwise the detonation will occur and uh, we could have broken pistons. All right, and similarly, we want to make sure the fueling is safe there. So if, again, if um, this is a picture of the fuel map, if we have a point that we've tuned uh, 200 kPa and 7,500 revs and the fueling is safe at that point, let's make sure that all the numbers above there are the same or higher. If it's got a rising rate fuel pressure regulator, there may not be as much uh, increase in map height here. But certainly we need numbers going up. It doesn't matter if it goes really rich, if the boost goes high, but the last thing we need is uh, smaller numbers at higher pressure. So it will mean um, that you're going to have problems with uh, detonation again, potentially. All right, so uh, overboost cut setting, just review that, and the default manifold pressure setting uh, that we spoke about earlier as well. I want to be very careful. Playing with ignition and boost are the two things that uh, can cause you grief and engine parts to uh, expire. All right, so testing. Start with small tests. Uh, I call it having a bit of a look. Now, you could be on an engine dyno, a chassis dyno. You could be on the water. You could be on the track. You, what you need to do is is get some small request numbers in that boost aim table. So start right down at 20 or even 10. And simply put your foot foot down and just quickly come up into the revs until you feel the boost coming on. Or if you've got a boost gauge or a dash, have a look. Just have a quick look and make sure nothing's getting out of control. If you give it a, um, you know, a boot full and you get this big cut happening, that means you've hit the boost limit and you've got, you've got problems. So don't move any more, like don't, don't, don't do any more testing. Come in and suss out why you got so much boost. Drop the number right down to zero and go out and try it again. If you've still got problems, still massive amounts of boost, maybe you've got the polarity wrong. You could try the number, the duty number at 100, again, very carefully. And if all of a sudden with the duty number at 100, you're sitting at your wastegate spring pressure of 12 pound, then you've got the polarity wrong. Now you can still, you can tune where 100 means low boost and low numbers mean high boost. That's up to you, but you need to get a feel for what numbers in the aim table make what boost. So if, for instance, I'm on the engine dyno, uh, it's a nice, good controlled environment, and uh, we'll nail the throttle, and we might be sitting at our nice, safe air fuel ratio, right on the gate pressure might be 10 pound I'll get set up have someone watch the engine and then I'll just start typing I'll go 20 enter 40 enter 60 enter now if the boost doesn't do anything dramatic during that test or it might just climb small amounts I can stop download the logging and then have a look and see what duty made what boost and it's somewhere along the line maybe 40 maybe 50 you'll find the boost really starts to climb because 20 is usually a big step. So you might find that as soon as it went over, it did, didn't do much until it got to 40. Uh, it only did a little bit of 40, but at 60 it made a, a whole heap. Then go back and do the test, start at 40, and then maybe go up in, in fives or even twos. And just need you to log and record what 
duty made what boost? If you're on the road or on the water, what you basically you proceed with a bit more caution. Just enter 20 in the whole table. Go and have a test. Come back, look at the logging. Try doubling at 40. Go back, do your test, and again, if you haven't made your maximum boost yet, keep adding numbers. As soon as you get to a number where the boost starts to climb, then only small numbers after that. So you, the aim is to, to find what duty makes what boost. This is, this is the main task. All right, so eventually, uh, if, you, uh, if, you, if you've been careful, you should have uh, an engine in one piece and some numbers written down that represent boost levels. So we find uh, a level of numbers that suit all those boost levels. Uh, what we do is we put those numbers in the aim table, and then we can go and run the engine for some longer periods of time. Maybe it's in a, in a car, and you can go out and do a couple of laps at the track and try experimenting with different numbers. Have a look at the data logging after your test and have a look and see for certain throttle positions, RPMs, uh, you'll have certain duties making certain amounts of boost. So collate all that information and then use it to fill out your boost control aim table. So as I said here, it's likely that will be different numbers for the same boost and RPM and that the boost will be affected by the, maybe the time it's spent held at full throttle, maybe the position of the throttle. There's all sorts of things that can affect boost. All right, but once the numbers have been found, we can then structure that uh, aim boost table. So here's three examples of three different aim tables. On the first one here, we've got RPM across the top, and it's 3D with throttle position on the vertical axis, on the Y axis. Now what this allows the uh, tuner to do is kind of give the boost or the engine a more naturally aspirated feel. So as the customer uh, or the, the driver is at 50% throttle, he's only got maybe 50% of the boost available. As he goes to full throttle, he gets the full amount of boost that he's after. And often you'll find that depending on the compressor uh, map of the turbo, even if you were to run, uh, say, an exact 20 pound boost across all the RPM, often you'll need to run more duty as the RPM goes up to try and maintain a set boost level. Now, that, that's not what you may want to do, but effectively change the numbers to change the boost where you want it. Um, changing the numbers proportional to a second sensor, like the throttle position, allows you to increase boost based on throttle position. Here's a very simple uh, 2D aim boost table. This one's more suited to potentially drag racing. So here we have a ground speed channel which is coming from a wheel speed sensor and the customer might find that he's got too much boost uh, on the line. Normally he uses anti-lag to, to leave it on the line and but he can't run the full boost until the car is progressing down the track and he's got some traction. Um, so we find we, in the example here at 10, maybe 10 mile an hour, 10 kilometers an hour, whatever is configured, we're running a table number of 56, which might be say 15 pound boost. And then as the car goes faster, we can get ramp in more boost. So we get uh, the boost coming into the limit of the tire or the track. And this way, uh, we don't have problems with uh, wheel speed and you know, loss of traction. Another uh, simple table, and all of these, of course, are open loop duty numbers. Uh, third example here is one where the, we have a boost control uh, channel, which has been created, uh, can be created a number of ways. This one was created off one of our dashes where the customer can dial a number in on the dash using a switch or a button. Customer dials uh, uh, the big center number on one of our dashes up, just keeps pushing the up button. And as that number goes from one to two to three to four to five on the dash in front of them, we add duty. So simply uh, adding extra duty for each time the number goes up on the dash.
and that information is sent back to the ECU on the CAN bus and then put on as an, as an axis on the aim boost table. So basically, similar to the earlier example with a switch, uh, you can effectively dial up whatever boost level you want. And often that's more appropriate than wanting to aim for a set value. It's more the customer can control the boost that he feels is, is necessary at the time. Okay, a couple of results, uh, some screen captures from i2 from some logging. I'd expect that you would set your page out like this when you're looking for um, what boost is being made by the duty, you know, what duty cycle is making what boost. So on our i2, someone coming in, on our i2 page here, the uh, key things that we're after initially anyway is RPM, throttle position, manifold pressure, and the duty cycle of the boost control solenoid. So in this example, auxiliary four duty cycle is what we've logged. So if we have a look here, we can see that customer is flat through this section, so flat out. And the RPM, this is actually a PWC, some PWC logging. So effectively the RPM at our data point here is 7,300. Customer has been flat the whole time, and the duty cycle at this point is 38. Now, the whether it's a wide open throttle timer or a switch, the duty cycle is increased. You can see the duty cycle goes up. If we were live in the software, we could click it where the arrow is and see what that number is, but it's approximately 70. We can see the manifold pressure going up, and we can also see the RPM climb from the extra power. So in this particular setup, we can see immediately that we have a range of uh, boost, which is just under half a bar, so at uh, 44 kPa of boost, so either 12 pound or something, 13 pound, uh, 38% duty made 13 pound, and if this is going to about 65 or something here, we can see the boost has gone up to you know, a little bit over one bar of boost, so maybe went from 13 to 18 pound. So, that's the kind of result we want, and then we can take those numbers and put them in the AIM duty table. Here's another example. This is definitely one where I used a full throttle timer to vary the duty on the solenoid. Now, it was I needed to hold it longer uh, because the boost takes a while to build, um, so it was I wasn't the time was programmed to change too quickly. But you can see at the point that uh, I went flat in this particular case, the duty cycle again, let's have a look here, is 70% duty it went to. You can see the RPM went well up here yeah, over 8,000, flat the whole time of this test, apart from this little lift here, obviously. So then we dropped the, the computer, dropped the duty cycle down here, and it was a value of 30. You can see the RPM went down. We can see the boost went down to right on the wastegate, in fact, very low amount of boost, 130 kPa. Then the computer stepped up the uh, duty again, went back up to 70, and you can see the boost climb. And doing this on and off uh, when you're doing closed loop tuning allows you to see how well the boost responds to a given duty change. So we'll be doing that in our closed loop webinar. All right, that concludes uh, a rather large and extensive webinar on boost control. That's only half of it. We didn't uh, have too many of you nodding off. Um, as I say, before watching this one, it's useful to also watch the helpful hints on boost control. And coming up with a part two of uh, boost control setup will be the closed loop. Um, one Now I noticed a couple of people coming in late on this webinar. The webinar will be up online within hopefully an hour and you'll be able to view it then. And uh, obviously that can be found on our website at motec.com. I um, hope everyone's enjoyed it and uh, we'll catch you next time.